Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for being here. So I have a cold, clearly. That's why I sound like this. Um, but it's okay, it's okay. I'm prepared. I have my um, Earl Grey tea and it just fogged my glasses up and I have my Kleenexes, so just bear with me. I'm gonna do the best I can and I think it's gonna be okay because if you can get past the fact that I sound like this, I think you're really gonna enjoy the case today. So today is obviously Mystery Monday and we are doing the disappearance of Heather Elvis. I want to go into today's case just letting everybody know that I don't allow victim shaming on my channel. You are absolutely entitled to your opinion. You absolutely are allowed to write in the comments how you feel one way or the other. But we are never allowed on this channel to victim shame. I don't want to hear anybody ever calling the victim names or saying he, she, or they deserved what they got because they're victims. Nobody deserves the things that happen to these people. We all make mistakes and we usually get the chance to grow and go on with our lives and become different, better, more mature people. Don't blame the victim. Don't shame the victim. These are the only comments I will ever delete. Please be respectful in the comments. Please be kind to the people involved and to each other. And with that being said, let's just get started. Heather Elvis could have been any 20-year-old girl in any town in America. She could have been your daughter. She could have been your sister. She could have been your girlfriend. She could have been your best friend. She could have been the girl at the Starbucks that you see every morning and you think she's cute, but you never say anything to her. Heather was the middle child with an older brother and a younger sister, and she loved kids. In fact, at her local church, she would often volunteer to work in the daycare area to help care for the kids while everybody else was at mass. Heather even went on a missionary trip to Costa Rica where she would tell her father stories about how she met a small woman in a small town and built a roof for her because her roof was leaking and just a mess. So Heather and a couple other people helped her by building her a new roof. Also while she was in Costa Rica, she would visit the local orphanage there and help the kids learn how to read. Heather graduated from high school in 2011 and she was pursuing a degree in cosmetology. She was really artistic, she had a great eye for color, everybody said, you know, she was really great with makeup, she had a great eye for these things, and while she was pursuing that degree, she actually worked as a waitress at the Tilted Kilt in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. She loved Lana Del Rey, she loved using song lyrics on social media, she wanted to be independent, she wanted to make her own way in the world. She is every young girl at the age of 20. But Heather's life took a dark turn when she met a man and fell in love and then vanished. On July 7th, 2013, Heather tweeted, the guy who builds things at my job makes me cream myself. And later that same day tweeted, one of these days I will drag that man into the mop closet and have my way with him. She was talking about Sidney Moorer. He was a local businessman. He owned his own like handyman kind of maintenance business. It was called Palmetto Maintenance. He would go around to local businesses and basically service like their larger appliances, their the big walk-in coolers and the big uh, stoves and ovens and things like that that restaurants use. And he would often come into the Tilted Kilt to do work there. And their attraction to each other was pretty much immediate. So they would flirt with each other when he came in and she would get really excited to see him. Heather's friend, co-worker, and roommate Brianna said that Heather was like a little girl with this crush on Sydney. Um, she would talk to Brianna about him all the time, telling her about the things he said and the things they did together and the places they went. And when he would come into the restaurant, she would get really giggly and almost like run away, you know, kind of like a little girl with a crush and turn really red when she was talking about him, get really excited. So. So she was pretty much infatuated with him. She really was into him, and I can only assume because she was a beautiful young girl, Sydney was into her as well. Heather was 20 years old, and Sydney Moore was 37 at the time. So there was a considerable age difference, but neither of them seemed to care about that much. What was kind of a big problem, though, was Sydney was married to a woman named Tammy. They had three children together. Tammy worked part-time as a kind of travel agent. She helped people 
set up trips to Disney World and Disneyland, she had kind of an infatuation and an obsession with all things Disney, if you ask me. But um, she was mostly just a stay-at-home mom for Sydney and her three kids. And Sydney, who owned the Palmetto maintenance business, he brought in most of the income. Heather and Sydney pretty much had a relationship all the way through the summer of 2013 and even into September of 2013, but in October, Tammy found out somehow, some way, I'm still not sure, but Tammy found out about the relationship and it was like a bomb went off. She was understandably furious. You're, you know, a stay-at-home mother of three children. You find out your husband has been canoodling with a woman, you know, half your age, because at that point, Tammy was 40 years old. That would make me mad, but Tammy took it to a whole new level. She began calling and texting Heather all the time. She made Sydney call Heather while they were together in the same room, talked to Heather and said, uh, you're gonna end things with my husband now, and then gave the phone to Sydney and basically sat there, either on the line or just in the same room, to make sure that Sydney ended it with Heather or Heather ended it with Sydney. And at that point during that phone conversation, Sydney went all out, you know, telling Heather, like, you meant nothing to me. You were just a girl spread her legs. So he basically just sat there and put her down and talked bad to her to make her feel bad and probably to put a show on for Tammy to let Tammy know, you know, this was just a fling, like it doesn't mean anything, you don't have to worry about it. After Tammy discovered her husband's infidelity, she put him on lockdown. So she put a password on his cell phone, his cell phone. She put a password on his cell phone that he didn't know and only she knew so that if he ever needed to use his phone, he had to ask her permission to unlock it. She would go to work with him. Every time he left the house, she was with him. She even handcuffed him to the bed at night so he couldn't leave. Uh, that's crazy. Like if you have to do that to your husband so you can make sure he's not cheating, it's time to find a new husband, girl, enough. She took him to a tattoo parlor and forced him to get her name tattooed on his lower stomach. And I guess as he was getting tattooed, she looked at him and she said, well, if you hadn't done that thing with that girl, this wouldn't be happening right now. But keeping tabs on Sydney and raising their three children apparently didn't keep Tammy busy enough because she continued to harass Heather. She sent her a text in late October and it said, someone is about to get their ass beat down. Your bitch is about to take his last breath. You can tell me where you are right now or I will find out another way. That way won't have a great turnout for you. I'm giving you one last chance to answer before we meet in person, only one. And then this was followed by another text that said, hey sweetie, ready to meet the missus? Heather didn't respond back till November 1st, and she said, I think you're a little obsessed with me. I'm nobody you need to worry about any longer. Then on November 5th, Tammy responds back, by the way, dad no longer owns a phone. She's so creepy and weird because she was referring to Sidney Moore as dad in a conversation with his lover, who, I mean, I guess was young enough to be his daughter if he had her at 17. Weird, man. So she's obviously at this point trying to get under Tammy's skin, trying to get a reaction from her, just trying to hurt her and scare her and harass her because she's, she's pissed. Heather responded back to that creepy weird text with simply just a period, like a period. And I assume that meant, you know, I'm done with this conversation, I'm done with you, I'm not talking about this anymore, period. According to prosecutors, November 5th was the last time that Heather and Sydney would see each other in person. I'm not sure how they knew that. I'm not sure where they got those facts from, but that is stated in the report. So on November 15th, Sydney and Tammy take their kids across the country to California for a Disneyland trip. They loved all things Disney. They loved Disney to an unsettling, obsessive point. But anyways, they were gone for almost a month. They did not get back until October 11th. So while they were gone, it was almost like a weight lifted off of Heather. She didn't have the distraction of Sydney around. She didn't have the fear and threat of Tammy hanging over her head. While they were gone and out of town, Heather started to get her life back together. She started to get back to her old self. According to her roommate, Brianna, this was the time when she really just kind of 
began hanging out with friends and family more, began acting like the old Heather before all the drama with Sydney and Tammy had gone down. She even, you know, was about to start a new job as a makeup artist, which is exactly what she wanted to do and what she was going to school for. She started dating again, so she was definitely like trying to move past the whole Sydney thing, and it seemed to me like she was doing a good job of it. In December, Heather's roommate and friend Brianna, she left town to go visit family in Florida for the holidays. So that left Heather alone in their apartment. She and Heather would still text and speak frequently, and Heather told Brianna that she was going out on a date with a man she had met. The man's name was Steven Chiraldi, and he picked her up on the 17th of December at around 7 p.m. from her apartment. At that point, they went to have dinner, and then they drove around to look at Christmas lights, which was one of Heather's favorite things to do during the holidays. And then after that, he brought her to the Inlet Mall parking lot and taught her how to drive stick shift because his truck had a stick shift. She even texted Brianna to let her know that Stephen was teaching her how to drive stick shift, and she sent Brianna and her father, Terry Elvis, a picture of her in the driver's seat of Stephen's truck, and the caption of that picture said, just learn to drive stick, I'm a pro. It was kind of a inside funny joke with her and her dad because her dad had a truck that Heather loved, and he had always tried to teach her to drive stick, but he said it never ended well. Um, and, and it was kind of funny to them. They would always laugh about it. So he was happy to see her kind of taking initiative and learning how to drive a stick because he knew it was something she always wanted to do. Neither Brianna nor Terry Elvis would know that this picture of Heather looking happy, loving life, moving past the dark place in her life, that would be the last picture that they would ever see of her. She's dropped back off at her apartment by Steven between 1 and 1.15 in the morning. And then this is where things get really specific. So I'm going to glance down to my notes every so often because there is a very specific timeline. So at 1.35 a.m., Sydney Moore calls Heather from a payphone. Call lasts about five minutes. At 1.44 a.m., Heather calls her roommate, Brianna. And remember, Brianna's out of town visiting family for the holidays, and Heather calls Brianna and told her, you know, she was really upset. So she told her Sydney had called, and he said he was leaving his wife. He said he missed her, and he wanted to see her. And at this point, Brianna basically just said, you know, like, you're in a good place right now. Like, I don't want to see this ruined for you. I don't want to see you getting wrapped back up with this guy. Why don't you take some time, sleep on it, we'll talk about it tomorrow. And Heather told her, you know, she was. She was just going to hang out at home surf the internet for a little bit, and then go to bed. The call with Brianna lasted about 2 minutes and 20 seconds. At 2.29 a.m., Heather calls the payphone that Sydney had called her from earlier, and there's no answer. And then at 2.42 a.m., Heather's cell phone pings at Longbeard's Bar and Restaurant in Carolina Forest. At 2.57 a.m., she leaves Longbeard's Bar and Restaurant and heads to Augusta Plantation Drive, but then she turns around and goes back to Longbeards. And at 3.16 a.m., while she is still at Longbeards, Heather's cell attempts to call Sydney's cell phone. There's no answer. She leaves Longbeards and heads back to her apartment, arriving there about 3.19 a.m., but she doesn't stay put long. Heather attempts to call Sydney's cell phone again, and at this time, the call's answered. The call lasts for 4 minutes and 15 seconds. Sydney's cell phone shows that it is at his home, and Heather's cell phone shows that it is at her home. At 3.25, Heather's phone once again leaves her apartment. So remember, she gets back to her apartment at 3.19 a.m. and leaves at 3.25 after having a call answered by Sydney's cell phone. So at 3.25, Heather's phone once again leaves her apartment and heads towards Peachtree Landing, which is this little secluded wooded lake area that has a boat landing at it in Myrtle Beach. Her phone stops at Peachtree Landing at 3.37 a.m. At 3.36 a.m., a private home video surveillance camera captures a dark-colored Ford F-150 coming from the direction of the Mora residence heading in the direction of Peachtree Landing. The camera that captured this is only 1.7 miles away from the Mora residence. At 3.39 a.m., Heather tries to call Sydney's phone again. There's no answer. Calls are attempted from Heather's phone to Sydney's cell phone, again directly after, and then again directly after that. So she basically called him three times in a row. No calls were answered. 
Also at 3.39 a.m., a business surveillance camera captures a dark colored Ford F-150 heading in the direction of Peach Tree Landing, coming from the direction of the Mora residence. At 3.41 a.m., Heather calls Sydney again. There's no answer. At 3.42, there's no more activity coming from Heather's cell phone. So this either means that her phone was shut off or that the battery died. At 3.45 a.m., the business surveillance camera that saw the Ford F-150 driving towards Peachtree Landing sees the F-150 driving away from Peachtree Landing in the direction of the Mora residence. And then the home surveillance video camera at 3.46 a.m. captures that truck passing again, coming back from the direction of Peachtree Landing and heading in the direction of the Mora residence. And remember that home video surveillance camera is only 1.7 miles away from the home of Sydney and Tammy Mora. So on December 19th, Heather's car is found abandoned at Peachtree Landing, parked sideways for some reason, and her parents are contacted. The police show up to the house of Terry Elvis, who actually owned property in Peachtree Landing, weirdly enough, just yards away from where Heather's car was discovered, but they went to Terry Elvis' home and they asked him you know, about her car because it was registered to Terry and he had a spare set of keys, so he and the police went to Peachtree Landing, and actually he opened the car, and they kind of went inside the car and were looking around, and I guess it was messy, but Terry said that was pretty standard for Heather. You know, she was a 20-year-old girl, and she typically didn't keep her car very neat and tidy. I definitely didn't. I still, I still don't. The decision of the police to allow Terry Elvis into the car, to look in the car, and then as well to take that car and drive it home was highly like speculated at because it, technically it was a crime scene. They didn't take pictures of the crime scene. They didn't rope the crime scene off. They didn't go in the car, you know, with like gloves and everything to make sure that it was a sealed off and contained crime scene. And then they let him drive it home. It was just the way that was handled was heavily criticized, but I don't think the police knew it was a crime scene at the time. I think they just thought it was like a young girl ran away or maybe she had too much to drink so she parked her car and walked home. I don't think they thought that this was going to be the scene of a crime. But at the same time, that's kind of the police's job to think ahead and kind of consider all possibilities, so I don't know. Peachtree Landing, the surrounded wooded areas, and the water was obviously searched for Heather, but no sign of her has ever been found. For two months, the police followed leads and tips, any lead and tip that they got, and many were pouring in. But they kept circling back to Sydney Moore with, I think, good reason, right? So she was in a relationship with an older man who was married and had kids. His wife found out, threatened Heather, and, you know, basically then became a jailer to her husband. It's a weird situation. It's a situation where a lot of emotions are running high. It's no wonder to me that they kept circling back to Sidney Moore. And also during his first interviews with them, he had lied and misled them and basically did everything he could to not help out at all. When asked where he was the night Heather went missing, Sidney said he was handcuffed at home to the bed. He said he was handcuffed every night to the bed and that the only person who had the key to the handcuffs was his wife, Tammy. The biggest thing to me is that Sydney had initially denied making that phone call from the payphone that night to Heather, that first initial phone call where Heather told Brianna he said he was leaving his wife and he missed her and he wanted to see her. And um, he denied making that phone call, but then they, the police had video surveillance of him at that payphone at that time making that call. And so he finally admitted to it once he knew they had proof and said, yes, he did make the call, but he was only telling Heather to leave him alone and stop bothering him. But the funny thing is, Heather's cell phone records and Sydney's cell phone records were pulled and there was no sign of her trying to contact him at all in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. So why would he feel it necessary out of the blue at, you know, like 1.30 in the morning to call her and ask her to leave him alone? The other call, the answered call made from her cell phone to his cell phone that night, he claims he doesn't know anything about it. He doesn't know who it was on the phone. He doesn't know what they talked about and he doesn't even know how it got like on his cell phone records and Heather's cell phone records because he doesn't think it happened. 
but it did because it's on the cell phone records. In February, Sidney Moore began to file like weird police reports. So he said on multiple occasions he would be driving down the street with his family. Random people in cars would like drive up to him and shoot at him and his family in their car with automatic weapons and shotguns. No shots ever landed on him or his family or his vehicle, but he claims this happened on multiple occasions. I just thought it was worth noting that at this time he was making a lot of um, claims that people were harassing him and his family. And Tammy was saying the same thing, that people were harassing her, her husband, her kids. She wrote a Facebook message to one of her friends and it says, well, Sydney cheated on me in the months of September, October with a psycho whore who has since went missing and now her crazy daddy is threatening to kill my children in Sydney, therefore making Sydney stupid. This girl grabbed his business card out of the office at her workplace and had fantasies about him as far back as March, but talked about it in July, naming him. I don't know of any other word to describe my husband at this point. All you have to do is research this girl's Twitter, although four months of it has gone missing in the past couple of weeks, and her Tumblr to see what a twisted person she truly is. I could care less seeing that I had a boyfriend of my own for the past couple of years, but when someone brings my children into the scenario, it's a whole other story. I will not tolerate anyone hurting my children because my husband banged a hoe three times in the backseat of her car and nothing more. I could care less what he screwed around with, but the fact that this jerk is stalking my family is unacceptable. So basically, Sydney and Tammy were claiming that Terry Elvis was harassing them and stalking them and threatening to kill them and their children, which there's never been any proof of that, but that's what they were claiming. So I'm on Tammy's Facebook page right now, and um, it was also around this time that she began sharing basically news articles about how the Horry County Police Department was like corrupt and jailing people unnecessarily um, and even because they were innocent. And Horry County is the county in um, South Carolina where they lived. Sorry, I had to take my sweater off. I was getting hot. The chills of being sick, you know, like you're hot one minute, cold the next. On February 21st, the police searched the Moore home at 7.30 a.m. Within three hours of the home being searched, both Tammy and Sydney were booked into the J. Rubin Long Detention Center. There were six arrest warrants that were put out for Sydney and Tammy, and these were for indecent exposure, obstruction of justice to the investigation of Heather's disappearance, and um, kidnapping. Basically, they discovered that on December 20th, 2013, which was just a couple days after Heather went missing, Sydney was providing false and misleading information. You know, he lied. So, obstruction of justice. On February 24th, 2014, a press conference was held that basically said Sidney Moore was being charged for the murder of Heather Elvis. Apparently, something they found in the couple's home led them to believe that Sidney and Tammy had kidnapped and murdered Heather. Bail was set at $100,000 for each individual, which um, the Elvis family was not happy about. The judge was really lenient on them. They they at one point left South Carolina and they moved to Florida while they were like murder suspects because they said since the trial and everything going down, Sydney couldn't get any work in the area, so they had to move to Florida for him to be able to work because they couldn't, you know, make a living without him working. And so the judge let them move to Florida, which kind of shocks me a little bit, but I mean, I guess they were wearing electronic monitoring devices and they knew where they were, so it's not too crazy, I guess, but I don't know. It just seemed like they, the judge was a little lenient. So two years went on, you know, of this court battle like raging and going back and forth as court battles often do, but then suddenly on March 2016, the murder charges were dropped and the kidnapping charges were were dropped to pending or downgraded to pending. On June 20th, 2016, Sidney Moore's trial for the kidnapping of Heather Elvis began, and this is when information came out that Heather might have been pregnant. Heather's supervisor at the Tilted Kilt, she had noticed that Heather had been gaining weight, and she said she had also taken a pregnancy test that had come back inconclusive. Kind of weird. I've never taken a pregnancy test. And I've taken lots of pregnancy tests, you know, I got three kids. I've never taken a pregnancy test that's come back like inconclusive. You know, it's either like one line or two, a negative or a positive. 
it's pretty standard, so I'm not sure what that meant, but apparently the test came back inconclusive. Another supervisor of Heather's at the Tilted Kilt, he said that Tammy Moore had called him and basically told him that he had to fire Heather or, you know, her husband wasn't going to be doing work for the establishment anymore. She said that Heather was running around town, basically spreading rumors that she was pregnant with Sydney's child and it was making, you know, it probably was making Tammy look bad and she said it was ruining her family so the girl needed to be fired. And the supervisor at the Tilted Kilt, he said he didn't fire Heather, obviously, because she was a good employee. She wasn't late. She was a nice person. And he just thought it was kind of crazy that Tammy had demanded him to do that. The night that Heather disappears, right before he calls her from the payphone, Sydney is captured on surveillance camera buying a pregnancy test from a Walmart. But Sydney claims the pregnancy test had nothing to do with Heather. He claims that he and Tammy were trying to have another child why i don't know god why would you do that you're in the worst like possible position a marriage could be in but let's have another baby he said that tammy was pregnant at one point but she lost the baby and i think there is some proof from um like hospital records that she was pregnant at one time i couldn't really find a lot of evidence that backed that up it was just kind of like one source i saw that in so i i just thought i'd mention it here in passing but i don't know for sure so in Sidney Moore's murder trial, the jury was hung 10 to 2. It's worth it to note that one of the jurors was a friend of Sidney Moore's lawyer, but apparently the judge didn't think that was enough of a conflict of interest to remove the juror because he said that the juror promised it wouldn't affect his decision or opinion. Okay, there was alternates. There was other people that could have stepped in in this juror's place, but... The judge did allow this juror to stay on the jury and the jury ended up being hung 10 to 2. So 10 people without a body and without really much proof, 10 people believed that Sidney Moore had been involved in Heather Elvis's murder. That's pretty crazy. And that should tell you something. So then Sidney Moore goes on to basically just like um, attack Facebook, just verbal vomiting of things he should not have said, things that should have never come out of his mouth, much less been allowed to be typed down, reread before hitting post, and then still hitting post. So here's um, part of his Facebook post. Heather was not a relationship. Heather was not a girlfriend. Heather was not a fling. Heather was not a mistress. Heather was a girl that chased me at work and traded oral sex for pumpkin spice lattes. <laughs> and then he went on to suggest that Heather's father, Terry Elvis, was probably responsible for his daughter's disappearance because he used to sexually abuse her when she was younger and that Heather had told him this. Even though she's not a girlfriend, she's not a mistress, she's not a fling, she's just, you know, trading oral sex for pumpkin spice lattes, you guys still had these deep conversations about her past and her family, and she felt safe to open up to you about traumatic childhood events. Which is it, Sydney? Which is it? Were you just um, trading PSLs for BJs, or were you uh, having deep conversations about her past and her childhood? You can't have it both ways. But he tried to. In the very same Facebook post, he tried to. Now it is worth mentioning that there, you know, were some shady dealings in Terry Elvis's past that were discovered. The only things that can honestly be legitimized is that he had a couple charges of fraud from the 1980s and he had an arrest for assault and battery in 2001. Everything else is alleged, everything else is speculated, nothing's actually proven, so I'm not going to go into all of that because I'm not about talking about the father of a girl who's gone missing. He's lost his daughter and unless he was doing something or acting in a way that made me suspicious of him which I don't think he is and I don't think he has in my opinion other people might feel differently other people might think he's involved I do not so in this video I'm not going to talk about what people say he did you know like there was allegedly an ex-girlfriend of his from the 80s who said he was a drug dealer and um, came up with a plan to burn down their trailer for insurance money or something. This whole sexual abuse thing, you know, Heather has an older brother and a younger sister and neither of them ever came forward with abuse allegations against their father. It's never been, you know, proven and people change. Like, maybe he was kind of like a bad guy in the 80s. In the 80s, people change, you know, he 
got married, had kids, he became heavily involved in his local church, people can change and get better and leave their like younger, immature selves behind them. It's possible. So why does it have anything to do with the fact that his daughter's missing and he every day is looking for her and advocating for her return? So I don't think he had anything to do with it. Sorry, there's like fuzz flying in the air. Because he owned property in Peachtree Landing really close to where Heather, you know, was last seen or was last spotted on GPS. People thought that was weird, but why is it weird? You know, he lives in in that area. Okay, so the one odd thing that I did find was a Facebook post that Terry Elvis posted to his Facebook two months before Heather went missing. And it's basically about how to like get rid of and hide a body. So this was on October 10th, 2013. So Terry says, don't use concrete, use topsoil and sand mix, cover with leaves or yard scraps. Concrete is a dead giveaway for where you buried them. I mean, yeah, that's odd. Definitely strange. It doesn't mean that he kidnapped and killed his daughter. It means that maybe he, you know, is interested in darker things. And, you know, you and me, I'm making this video, you're watching it. We're interested in true crime. We've thought about these things before, right? I would never post it on Facebook because that's weird, but... I don't know. And I guess people have accused him of fraud concerning the fund to help find Heather, saying that he, you know, paid off his house, purchased two new vehicles, jet skis. Once again, that is alleged. There's obviously been no proof or the police would have had him on the radar. And to my knowledge, the police never suspected him or thought he was involved at all. And I feel like they know more than I do or you know, any of us do. And he's a father, like he's a grieving father, you know, there'd be no reason for him to kidnap and murder his daughter. She wasn't having a negative impact on, on his life. And, you know, they seem to have an okay relationship. Just the night that she went missing, she was texting him while she was on her date, you know, pictures of her driving a stick shift. So clearly they didn't have this bad relationship where they weren't talking or she didn't feel like he would be happy with her for sharing something that was good in her life. I don't see it. So that's my opinion. Don't come for me or do, I don't care. So new developments have happened in this case just this week. So on Tuesday, October 23rd, this past Tuesday, Tammy Moore was sentenced to 30 years in prison for the kidnapping of Heather Elvis. Um, Sydney's trial for kidnapping is set to start probably within the next couple of months. They did say sometime in 2018 and we're running out of time in 2018. And it can't come soon enough because yes, he's currently in prison for obstruction of justice, but I think he's like going to be out for parole in a couple of years. And I really don't want to see this guy like ever walking the streets again, ever, you know, keep all the 20 year old girls who want pumpkin spice lattes is safe from Sydney Moore because this guy's a scumbag, like regardless of whether he kidnapped her, regardless of whether he was involved in her death. We don't even know if she's, if she's dead. I can only assume because it's been, you know, several years now and there's been no sign of her. I do think that she came across foul play but even if he's not involved in any of that, this guy's a scumbag. He cheated on his wife, who, yes, was crazy, but still, you're married. You know, get a divorce. Cheated on his wife, who he had three children with, um, with a 20-year-old girl who's vulnerable and young and, you know, doesn't know anything about life right now pretty much. She's just learning. Then when his wife finds out, he basically calls this girl and just like, makes her feel like crap. Then he calls her and wants to meet back up. Then he, you know, when she goes missing, starts writing these horrible things about her on social media for everybody to see. Like, what a scumbag. Ugh. All right, so, I mean, let's talk about the theories. I think you clearly know what my idea of the theories are, but these are the theories that float around out there. Some people think that Heather left, um, that she left of her own free will. I did spend a lot of time on Heather's Twitter. I actually enjoyed being on her Twitter. She was smart and she was funny and yes, yeah, sometimes she was crude. I felt like she was me at that age. You put on this big show, you put on this 
basically a facade, like you have a really high self-esteem and you think really highly of yourself and so people think that comes off as arrogant, but it's just, it's normal like young woman things to do. You know, when you're 20 years old, that's how you, you can act sometimes. So she would say things about herself, you know, self-deprecating, but at the same time then she would talk really well about herself and then on the other hand, she was posting really sad song lyrics and then on the other hand, she was, you know, talking about a married man that she wanted to become involved with. It was just a lot of back and forth showing basically the everyday life of a young girl. Like some days you feel great about yourself, some days you feel like shit. Some days you are happy and some days you want to write sad Lana Del Rey lyrics in your on your Twitter feed. It was so touching to me because I was that girl. You know those Facebook things like, oh, this is what happened seven years ago today? Like sometimes I look at those and I cringe because I was like, oh my God, why did I say that? Like why? You know, because I grew past that. And given the time and the opportunity, Heather would have grown past that and she would have matured and become a, you know, a more self-aware person. But that's normal for, for a young girl and people have talked terribly about her and said that because of her social media presence and the things she said on Twitter, like she was clearly a depraved person, was, you know, a slut, and it's just horrible. Everybody's like that when they're young. They put on a show for people. They try to act really self-confident. They try to act really, you know, sure of themselves, but underneath they're just growing and learning and trying to figure life out. So she would have grown past that. I know she would have. She was a good person and she was smart and she was witty and her posts, some of them made me laugh. Um, I just really, I really enjoyed looking back at her Twitter. But anyways, there was some post where she said, you know, I have to get out of this small town, there's nothing here for me. And where she said she was gonna book a trip to Thailand and just leave. And then she also wrote how much a ticket to Thailand cost. So some people think she was just, you know, stressed out with the whole Sydney and Tammy situation. She was done with her small town that she lived in. She wanted more and she left. I don't think so. She's 20, number one, so she would have no reason to stage a disappearance, you know? She would have no reason to turn off her cell phone and not use it anymore. She would have no reason to tell people, like, I'm leaving. She had no problem sharing everything else on social media. Why would she all of a sudden become this private person who didn't want anyone to know where she was? She would have at least told her roommate they were close. She would have told her parents um, where she was going and she would have kept using her cell phone. Why would she not use her cell phone anymore? Why would she try to basically just run away and never be heard from or found again? Plus, she was starting a new job that she was super excited about. You know, she had gone on this date that, you know, she by all accounts enjoyed and had a great time at and she could have had a second date with him. She was building her life up to the way she wanted it. So I don't think she would have just up and left. That's my opinion. Um, the second theory is that the man she went out on a date with that night, Stephen, that he did it. When they first talked to him, he was really cooperative, worried about her, wanted to help out. He even took a polygraph test and he passed. But when the cops pulled Tammy's GPS records from her cell phone, they kind of felt like what Stephen had told them about the night and how it had gone and where they had went didn't really line up completely with the records that showed on Tammy's cell phone, so they went to talk to him again about it to clear up the discrepancies, and at that point he kind of shut down and became uncooperative, and he didn't want to help anymore. And They asked for his cell phone records, and he wouldn't give them his cell phone, so I don't know. I guess that's kind of shady. It's also a little shady that um, right after she disappeared, Heather, he changed the seats in his car. So he like tore the seats out of his car and put bucket seats in. And that is like the last picture that was taken of her was her sitting in the driver's seat of his car, which is a weird coincidence. And typically I'll always tell you, I don't believe in coincidences. I say that to everybody. I don't believe in coincidences. I think everything happens for a reason and I think everything is connected and everything means something. But I don't, I don't think that Steven had anything to do with it. I think he was afraid that they were gonna try to pin it on him after it happened because he was the last person to see her alive and he's probably seen a crap ton of Law and Order, like we all have, and he kind of knows like how these things can go. Last person to see them alive, usually a romantic partner, like all signs would point to him. So he probably didn't want to give the cops anything that could help them build a case against him. That's my opinion. 
Obviously, we've already talked a little bit about it. A lot of people think Terry Elvis did it. I don't, so I'm not gonna talk any more about it. And we already did talk a little bit about his past and why people suspect him and the horrible things that Sydney said about him and what he apparently happened with him and his daughter. So I'm not gonna talk any more about it. And obviously, the last theory, which is the theory I believe is Sydney and Tammy together kidnapped and murdered Heather Elvis. With Sydney being on lockdown so much, why would he have been allowed to leave the house at one o'clock in the morning to go make a phone call from a payphone to call Heather and let her know that he missed her? Why wasn't he chained up in his bed again? Why, you know, was he allowed to leave the house? So I think that Tammy and Sydney both went to this payphone and she was with him waiting in the car while he made the call from the payphone. And I think they wanted to lure Heather out of her home and have her meet them somewhere so that they could, you know, do harm to her. I think that, in my opinion, Tammy honestly believed that Heather was pregnant and didn't want her husband, the bastard child, running around town being a source of everlasting, like, embarrassment for her and her family. So the security cameras captured the dark Ford F-150 driving towards Peachtree Landing and back that night. Sydney and Tammy do own a black Ford F-150 and I think in court they pretty much proved that that was the vehicle that was caught on the surveillance cameras. So why are you driving to Peachtree Landing at the same time that, you know, Heather is there? And why is Heather there? Because you told her to meet you there. That second phone call that went to Sydney's cell phone, I don't believe that Sydney had that cell phone with him. I think that Tammy still had the cell phone because we know she basically took it from him and she even told Heather, like, Dad doesn't have a phone anymore. I think she had it and I think she either answered it or gave it to Sydney to answer and told him to tell Heather to meet them at Peachtree Landing. Because why else would Heather be there? You know, it's in the middle of nowhere, really. It's secluded. It's like three o'clock in the morning. What is her motivation to go there unless she was told to meet someone there? So the timeline's really tight. At 3.41 a.m., Heather calls Sydney again and there's no answer. And so we can assume that nobody was there at this point. It was just Heather. And then at 3.42, there's no more activity found on Heather's phone, so she's off off the grid at this point. And then at 3.45, the business surveillance camera records the truck going back towards the Mora residence. So this would have hap to happen really quickly. I think Tammy was hiding in the back of the truck or the back seat, and Sydney pulled up to Heather's car, which would have been the only car there, and you know, parked sideways, so pretty obvious. And he was just like, quick, get in, get in, you know, motion for her to get in when she got in the car because she trusted him, and he told her to meet her there and told her he was leaving his wife and he missed her. Why would she not get in? So when she got in, he was probably like, shut your cell phone off. I don't want anybody to be able to track us. You know, my wife's crazy. She probably has a tracker on your phone. Turn it off. So she probably then willingly turned her phone off. I'm not sure when something happened to her. I'm not sure what happened to her, but I do believe that she was in that truck with both Sydney and Tammy, and I think that um, you know she was killed by them. And I don't know where her body is, but you have to understand this is Myrtle Beach. You know this is swampland. There's a lot of places that you could put a body where it would be hard to find. There was also um, a person who testified in the case, and I believe he was a cousin of Sydney's or Tammy's, but he claims he saw a picture of Heather on a cell phone at the Moore residence, and the picture of Heather was clearly taken after she went missing, and he said that the picture really unsettled him, like it disturbed him, and it made him afraid because it, it was just, it, it wasn't a good picture. And it was definitely, you know, he claimed that he knew it was taken after she went missing. So I believe that, and this is just my opinion, so don't come for me, I believe that they probably took her somewhere and Tammy tortured this girl and Tammy took out all the hate and the anger and frustration of the past months of basically being made a fool of around town, of basically, you know, knowing that her husband had stepped out on her and she took it out on this girl and then they killed her. You know, clearly there's a lot of victims in this case. First of all, Heather. Heather was a beautiful girl. Heather had her whole life in front of her. I know there's people out there, like I said, that, that slut shame her and say that she was at fault, that she broke up a marriage, but no, she was 20. 
Sydney was 37. Tammy was 40. You have two grown adults here who obviously had issues in their marriage and he's the one that broke his vows, his marriage vows. Heather wasn't married. Heather wasn't dating anybody. Was she wrong? Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't get involved with a married man. We make mistakes when we're young. We do things impulsively. We do things because they feel good. We do things because we want to. That's a really big trademark of being, you know, young and immature still and growing. So do I blame her for getting involved with a married man? Sure, she made a mistake. Do I think she deserved to be kidnapped and killed? Absolutely not. And there's literally people out there saying that because she's a slut, because she knowingly went after a married man, she deserved what she got. And once again, I will reiterate, please do not say anything like that in these comments. It will be deleted. There's just no reason for it. This girl's gone. She probably met a really terrible end. She had her life stolen from her, her entire life stolen from her. And nobody deserves that. I don't care what you did. Nobody deserves that. And it wasn't Tammy and Sydney's call to make. There's other victims in this case. You have Tammy and Sydney's kids. They have three kids. I feel really bad for these kids. Uh, they obviously didn't choose to have parents who would do something so stupid and detrimental to everybody's lives in this situation and now their parents are both in prison for a while and you know they have to grow up without a mom and a dad and i hope that they overcome this and they move on and they still you know have happy and healthy lives it's possible they can do it um they're probably better off away from these two people and obviously you have heather's family Heather's brother, Heather's sister, Heather's mother and father. They're still looking for her. They still think she's out there. They still want to find her and they want to know what happened. And they you know, even said they would sit down and talk to Sydney and Tammy if they thought that it would bring some sort of closure or conclusion to the whole thing. If Sydney and, and Tammy could tell them where Heather was, whether she's alive or dead, they just wanna know. And they know that Sydney and Tammy know. Just in case Heather is still out there, I do wanna give you guys a description. Obviously, once again, it's important for people on YouTube and social media to keep a lookout for people who are missing and Heather Elvis is technically still missing. So she had a couple tattoos. She had a six inch compass rose on the inside of her left forearm, a six inch stylized sea turtle, on the left side of her torso, an infinity symbol on the right side of her torso, a small ocean wave on the outside of her wrist, and a sugar skull on her right thigh. She's described as being about five foot one with brown hair and weighing about 118 pounds. She also has brown eyes. She's been missing from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina since December 18th of 2013. If anybody sees her or has any information about her disappearance, please call the Horry County Sheriff's Office and the number is 843-915-5350. I will put a link of Heather's Twitter in here as well in case you wanna scroll through. I think it's a really telling, beautiful kind of story about a young girl who is trying to find her way in the world. She is poetic and can be dark sometimes but can also be really happy and really funny and really relatable. And um, I'm very, very sad that she's gone and I'm very, very sad that she didn't get a chance to grow up and become a mother because I think she would have been an excellent mother. I'm really sad that she didn't get to live her life and um, it's unfortunate that these things happen, but I will keep you guys updated on this case if you'd like. As I said, Tammy Moore is going to be in prison for the next 30 years. Hopefully she doesn't get paroled and um, I have a good feeling because of the way that Tammy's case went, when Sydney gets up on trial for the kidnapping of Heather, that he will as well be convicted of that. I definitely think they did it together, and I think everybody else thinks that too. Okay guys, thank you so much for being here. It's um, getting to that time now where I have to leave for work, but I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for all the support I've gotten for my channel and my videos. I love that you guys are out there watching these videos. I love that you guys are there to discuss these with me. I love that we have a little community here now 
that I can depend on and go to when I want to talk about true crime. If you like this video, give it a big like. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and subscribe and I'll see you in the comment sections of my next videos. Thank you guys so much. Stay kind and stay beautiful. Have a great day. Bye. Well, they say people come, they say people go, this particular diamond is extra special, and though you might be young, and the world may not know, still I see a celestial. I should, but I can't let you go But when I'm cold Cold And when I'm cold Cold There's a light that you bring me When I'm in shadow a feeling